Hi, I'm Tom Sparling. I'm the director of Creative Manitoba, and I'd like to welcome you all here to the first Merging Mindsets uh, panel workshop discussion. Uh, it's on 3D printing, materials uses, and challenges. Uh, I just have a couple things to say before we get started. I would like to acknowledge that we are on uh, Treaty 1 territory, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dene, Dakota, and Oji Cree, and homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, we would also just like to note that with all of our programs, we have an intent to make these to foster a supportive, non-threatening environment for everyone to participate and share in. So regardless of gender, ability, ethnicity, or cultural differences, we please ask that you're welcoming and respectful of worldviews that may differ from your own. Thanks. <coughs> so on to 3D printing. Um, Christopher is on his way. He's just finding parking. So we're going to get started, and he'll join us um, as soon as he find, uh, finds a place to park. <coughs> I'm, I'm pretty much of a Luddite, and I think maybe that's a good thing because I can ask <laughs> dumb questions that maybe some of you have. Uh, I might be intimidated to ask. So we have an awesome uh, expert uh, panelists, uh, uh, a group of panelists assembled here, and uh, they're each going to speak for a little bit of time, and then I've got a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So make notes. If you've got questions, you'll have an opportunity to ask them. Uh, I'm just going to introduce everybody, and um, <clears throat> and then we'll we'll get started with the with the experts here. Um, Marnie Stapley uh, at the end is the VP of North Forge Technology Exchange. She's responsible for the the fabrication lab just over on Adelaide. If you haven't been there, it's super cool. You should uh, go and take a look. She's also the vice uh, uh, VP of, of business development at Fabalu, which is a an online. Um, journal, I guess, a web publication dedicated to 3D printing, and I've been following it for the last little while, and it's quite remarkable the broad breadth of information about 3D printing that you guys are sharing and, and from around the world. Um, and, and one other thing, Marnie is, among other things, she's the Manitoba Ambassador for Women in 3D Printing. Um, so next we have Erica Lincoln, who is an artist working primarily in, in installations that explore systems, trying to understand the transmission of knowledge, ideas, and more. Um, Erica's practice is centered around art and tech, and you might have seen the, the really cool armored beluga whale uh, prints that we used in the, in the um, graphic for the promotion of this event. Those are, are Erica's work, um, very cool. Um, and Grace Nichol is an award-winning ceramic artist, associate professor at the University of Manitoba School of Art. Uh, I was looking at her, her website and it, it ran out of room to list all the awards, the international awards, the lists of, of exhibitions. Um, it was quite amazing. Uh, she says she's a digital technician and designer and I'm, I'm really interested to see how a ceramic artist <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll wait till Christopher arrives to introduce him, and what we can do to, to kick things off is, is ask Marnie to, to start. Okay. So, thank you for having a mic, because I don't talk very loudly, so. Um, women in, in 3D printing started um, the first chapter in Canada a year and a half ago. Um, we're now the third um, chapter in Canada. There's one in Toronto, one in Vancouver, and one in Winnipeg. And I started um, becoming involved in women in 3D printing after uh, there were some women that went through the fabrication lab on a tour. And they didn't join after, and I asked them why, and they let me know that they felt intimidated. At the North Forge Fabrication Lab, we're about 90% male, 10% women. It is starting to, we are starting to get uh, more women that come out, but the reason why I started this was really to, um, to support 
and encourage uh, women who are interested in becoming involved with additive manufacturing or 3D printing. I use additive manufacturing um, interchangeably with 3D printing. You may hear the term additive manufacturing. It's often used with industry, so with aerospace, healthcare, manufacturing, 3D printing, it's usually um, often referred to as additive uh, manufacturing. Um, women in 3D printing, I do have some um, brochures. I have a whole bunch of samples up here too, but I have some pamphlets about it if anyone's interested. Um, we started out with a chapter in San Francisco, London, England, Paris, France, and Winnipeg, Manitoba. So I think that's pretty cool how it started. Now we're in 15 countries and there's 30 different chapters. So if you're interested in some resource information to learn more about 3D printing, um, you can visit the website, uh, Women in 3D Printing. This is just a visual um, of um, all of the global 3D printing chapters, and it keeps growing. So Fab Lou, this was um, mentioned in my introduction. Another great um, resource if you're wanting to learn more about 3D printing and read about 3D printing. So this is an online news publication. Um, it's free. We don't charge anyone to, um, to read it <laughs> online. And you can subscribe to a newsletter. Um, and it's, um, it's read all over the world. Um, about 60% of our readers are North American. The rest are from Europe and all over the world. We write and publish about four stories every day, only on 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing explained. So this is um, my explanation of 3D printing. If you're familiar with um, CNC machining, where you have um, a block of wood and you're subtracting away material to form your part. That's called subtractive manufacturing. With 3D printing or additive manufacturing, you're adding layers. So you start with a 3D model and you, um, you save it as an STL file. Different printers have different, they're called slicers. So you slice the model, you, you don't have to all remember this, there's no test out there. Um, the slicer then, it um, converts it to what is called a G-code, and that's what the 3D printers recognize to be able to print it as a, as a 3D print. So it, um, it reads the model and it's laying down very fine layers, so it's additive manufacturing. Um, you'll hear the term filament and materials, so there's um, a very common material is called a PLA or ABS. PLA is not very expensive. You can buy, yeah, that's PLA. Um, she brought some examples. Yeah, you, and this one as well. You can buy a kilogram of PLA material for roughly $30. And then there's a lot of other materials, um, metal materials. You can print um, titanium, polycarbonate, nylon is very strong materials, um, composite carbon fiber. Um, and, I, and I'm going to talk about some really interesting materials that I, I came across last week, and I have some samples of those as well. Um, sand 3D printing. I saw this last week. It was, um, and I have a sample of, so you can 3D print in sand. Um, 
So this is um, yeah, sure. This is a German company, and they per they produce incredible solid 3D prints from sand, um, typically for artists and designers. Uh, their process is essentially a fancy type of, we call it post-processing. So normally they have um, prints printed on a 3D printer called a voxel jet or X1. I don't know of any, anyone in Manitoba that has one of these particular 3D printers. Um, but both of those machines can print in sand. So they use an epoxy-based infiltration um, is performed on the raw sand and the print is transformed into an incredibly solid and durable um, object. And um, they've, they're building a rapidly growing list of creative clients who seem more attracted to the notion of 3D printing sand objects um, than plastic objects. So this was a 3D printed uh, light uh, fixture and this is a 3D printed, another light fixture and uh, a sink. It was a beautiful sink and so believe it or not, that's a, a 3D printed sink. And this they called it um, a pile of fruit and this was sand uh, 3D printed. And here's one more picture. I was a little obsessed with all of these uh, 3D printed pieces. Oh, and one more. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> so that um, statue thing, they likely uh, 3D scanned it and then they 3D printed that in sand. Just give me one moment. This was, um, uh, they called it a, it was a clutch bag made of titanium. So this was 3D printed. And I have a sample of, of a heart, and this was 3D printed in titanium as well. This clutch bag, um, it has a, uh, if you can read that, it has a wrist loop, and they called it a kiss latch. It was 3D printed in two parts, and the print time was 135 hours. And you can 3D print glass. I have some notes on this that I haven't memorized, so I just want to read these uh, to you. Um, their product, uh, this was another German company. Um, I saw this last week in Frankfurt called Glassmer. And their product is a liquid uh, resin. Resin's a type of material that you can 3D print. Um, and it can be, it was cured in, at room temperature to form solid glass with some post-processing. Uh, the material can be used on any resin printer. So at North Forge Fabrication Lab, we have two resin printers. Um, and their process involves a light source of suitable frequency and layer by layer, it's printed to form a solid object. Um, it appears fully liquid. With, it had the consistency of very soft honey. I would describe it like that. Um, what you don't see is the glass. So the resin is surprisingly 60% glass. And there are tiny glass particles mixed in with an organic uh, binder. The binder is what basically sticks it all together. And the glass <laughs> particles are rather small. Uh, they're 50 to 100 nanometers in size. 
So a nanometer is a thousand times smaller than a micrometer. It's about a hundredth of the wavelength of visible light. Yeah. As well. So. And the post-processing involves heating or sintering the glass. But you can see the final product on the right-hand side. After all of the post-processing, after it's printed, it's um, solid glass. Uh, this is, yeah, the, um, you can do some interesting things with 3D printing. You can go on a website called Uformit. I took that file on the left-hand side and I, I said it, I designed it in quotations because all I did was pull the, the, um, the pieces of the 3D model to form what ended up being on the right-hand side, a metal uh, necklace. So that was 3D printed in stainless steel. There's a lot of resource information online um, called uh, print uh, repositories, like Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, Shapeways, you imagine. So you can go on Thingiverse, you can search for a 3D print file, download it, and you have the STL file for the print, and then you can if you have access to a 3D printer, then you can print it. Um, these are some examples of quite beautiful vases um, printed in PLA material. I just made note there of 3D modeling using Fusion 360. So if someone is looking for a recommendation or how to do 3D modeling, uh, Fusion 360 is um, one of the easier ones to try and you can get a free license as a startup business or as a non-profit business. Um, yeah, these are just some random pictures. Um, I'm also involved with North Forge Fabrication Lab in the middle. On the right hand side on the top, that's um, what our 3D printing room looks like. And at the bottom is just some examples of um, some prints that um, on the bottom right, our maintenance manager, uh, Jeff Stobie, he 3D prints parts to fix equipment at the fabrication lab. On the bottom, on the bottom right is a lockout tagout box. So if a piece of equipment is um, broken, then he 3D printed that so the cord goes through that and he locks it so it locks out. And this is my last slide. So it's just, um, if you wanted to take down any of that contact information for myself or fablu.com, that's the um, online news northforge.ca with our fabrication lab just down the street. Oh, and another resource information for you if you're interested in learning a bit more about how to do 3D printing, we do offer basic 3D printing training um, on Adelaide Street. And then that's my phone number. Thanks very much, Marty. That's awesome. We're just going to take two seconds to swap out some tech. And uh, Erica is going to talk for a little bit and let, let us hear what she has to say about it. Uh, thank you, Marty. Um, I met Marty, of course, at uh, Fab Lab, the Fab Lab at North Forge. I was trying to remember the date, but I can't remember the date. Nine years ago. Nine years ago. <laughs> 2010. 2010. Okay, good. Because I was trying to figure out. So what I'm going to do in my talk is I'm going to sort of talk about what I do as an artist and then sort of how I kind of came to 3D printing and sort of what I kind of think about with 3D printing and then from there I'm just going to talk about some other artists that I find are doing some interesting things I'm trying to conceptualize 3D printing in a completely different way other than just sort of printing an object just sort of thinking about how do you use a machine <coughs> lost my voice there how do I how do you use a machine could a machine be an object as an art piece? Um, 
so these kind of things. Um, and also 3D scanning because that's sort of part of it. So Mind the Gaps is just a term that I kind of was using. Everybody's familiar with Mind the Gap for not falling through the, the, subway, <laughs> the subway platforms. But um, I use it because um, when you're 3D scanning, uh, it's not a perfect process and you usually end up with holes and things, so you have to sort of fill it. So the idea of gaps and holes, so that's sort of why I call it Mind the Gaps. Um, here's just a quick um, shot. There's the studio. I don't have a 3D printer. I guess I should flip back here. The picture you see here is a RepRap, which is a do-it-yourself 3D printer, build-your-own 3D printer, which kind of had a bit of a life early 2000s. Um, and the whole idea was that um, the person that developed this, this was an all open source um, machine. So you could have the materials, it would teach you how to put it together, and then you'd also have all the programming to run the machine and the G code to um, translate your 3D file that would turn the, which, which uh, would make the machine go and print for you. Um, this is this machine here. Basically, um, a lot of the, new, the newer, kind of low, lower priced 3D printers kind of come out off of this, like the MakerBot. Um, this is sort of where MakerBot kind of got its ideas and then sold it to Stratasys for millions of dollars. Um, okay, so back to me. Yes, back to me. So my studio has no printer, but. Uh, that object over there on the top is the first 3D print I ever made, and I printed it at North Forge, and it's a satellite. And what you see is you've got support material, and then the black of the actual satellite. And you can see that this is considered a horrible print, a failure, because of, I'm going to, I wonder if I can, oh, I'll use my mouse. Okay, here, I had no support material, so um, the filament just sort of fell. Um, it broke in half. Um, oh, you can't see my mouse. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it like this. <laughs> um, Left-handed mousing. Here we go. Oh, and I've lost it again. So uh, here's the bottom uh, that uh, the bottom that fell out. So this is a filament that just had no support, so it just drooped and wobbled. It broke in half. Um, you can't see very well in this picture, but the support material that's holding the actual print is a brown and then the print is black. But the support material made it look like it was like a, when it came out of the printer, I thought, oh, it, it's like this old satellite that crashed into Earth and it had been sort of weathered. And, and so I just sort of invented this whole idea of this. This is the coolest stuff ever. And so this is, this is what got me into 3D printing. Um, Marty had just talked about additive manufacturing, and um, so when I think about 3D printing, I sort of think about additive sculpture, and so my practice kind of came out of this idea of, you know, instead of taking away, you're always adding and adding and adding, so um, these are sort of earlier work. I'm going to be jumping around in years. I'm going to go back and forth. Um, just the idea of always sort of creating a three-dimensional form by adding material to the form. Um, as opposed to subtractive. Um, here's some other additive, additive sculptures. And uh, this is sort of based on the soft sculptures of Klaus Odenberg and his partner, Kusi van Rugen. And uh, my idea was to take these digital objects and make them material objects, physical objects, using fabric, but again, using additive as opposed to subtractive methods. And then also I do additive sculpture in the sense of kinetic, using kinetics to make material accumulation, material accumulations or um, um, trying to think of how to explain that, that there, because it doesn't make any sense unless there's video, because that's a sound piece. <laughs> but uh, use it, I, I, having uh, people, it being interactive, people can sort of add to the piece and that sort of generates sound and so on the idea of the additive component being interactivity, in my opinion, or in my sort of universe. Um, so I'm gonna jump back. So um, back to the 3D, the 3D printing uh, printers. That's the printer we built 
2019, which is a bit of a hot mess compared to that first picture I showed you with a nice perfect one. This is, uh, I, I uh, went to um, a workshop in Spain and this is the group of people I worked with building the, the, building the project. Um, this, ooh, this person right here is one of the, one of the MakerBot people, Zach um, Holkin. Um, so he was sort of the lead and we, we worked towards this. It's another interesting thing is he had just started up um, Thingiverse at the time. So we were trying to sort of build a Thingiverse and put all these, these models into it for uh, free distribution. And uh, I wrote a grant in 2014 to, and I was successful, which is all great, um, to do research in 3D printing and scanning. And this is back to the mind the gap, the idea of um, how you can make an object and how this additive process, which has continued in sort of my practice. Um, so in this image, uh, there's a hand holding a preform 3D scanner. These things are really heavy. They've made them a lot smaller now. Um, North Forge still has theirs. I use the, and that's something that's accessible. And, um, they also have the software, so if you're into 3D scanning and some, learning some of that stuff, you can certainly do that here in Winnipeg. This is sort of a smaller prosumer version, which is handheld. And you can, that's no bigger than a tablet, really. It's about the same size of a tablet, and it's plastic, and it's super light. And then this, this version down here is a scanner that you put on your tablet using the camera of your tablet. So things have really changed and moved quite, a, quite far ahead for um, 3D scanning. So the project I did was exploring sort of the soft, the whole process of 3D scanning and printing. And what I did, <laughs> um, starting with the scan, I scanned a 3D, uh, I scanned a bird's nest. And this is sort of the interesting part of the process of doing all this sort of stuff is that it takes a while to kind of learn it, make it work for you the way you want it to work. And sometimes you don't necessarily get a perfect thing that you want. And I really enjoy that because I really like the idea of um, glitches and things that don't work, but you make them work anyways. And sometimes new things or different things can sort of emerge out of that whole process. So that, this is the 3D scan of a bird's nest, and it was pretty much, a, you know, like a pretty failed, <laughs> failed scan. Um, and then the softwares that they use, that, that are used for these, this process, is that it, it, there's algorithms that will try to build the object for you. And I was really interested in that, with the idea of this automated process where the algorithm thinks it knows what it is and tries to make it. And so you don't say like it's a bird, you just sort of, the, so, the way the software works is you put points into these sort of halves when you scan, like you, what I was doing was scanning half a thing and the other half, and then you put it together, and then you have the software fill in the holes. And so let's make it really difficult for the software. And then the result is this form here, where you can sort of see, I guess what it was doing is trying to figure out I don't know what I was trying to figure out, but this is what I ended up with. <laughs> and so the great thing is, is then you can make it into um, a solid model, like an STL, and then you can export it uh, to, the, to the printer, and it'll print it for you. I was just using it to show you the, the scan. The software that uh, does all the filling of the gaps and everything is Geomagic X, Geomagic Design, uh, which comes with the the scanner, I believe, at uh, North Forge. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna skip, so minding the gaps, there's a few more. Uh, okay, so now I wanted to switch. I've got two minutes, oh God. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, I, I wanted to switch to talk about um, other artists that I find interesting. I'll flip to this one real quick. This is a sort of a manifesto on 3D printing and sort of the hack and the, um, uh, to talk about it. Uh, the cookbook has a whole bunch of interesting projects with 3D printing. Uh, this stuff is all online. You can download it. I will 
if anyone wants any information, I will give web sites. I'll just keep skipping here. Oops, now it's going to play. I am going to stop this because I don't have time. Uh, this is uh, artist Morishin Alahari, and she is actually coming to Winnipeg next week, uh, December 5th. She's going to be doing a talk on 3D printing at Plugin. I suggest everybody go. She does some, she's doing some really super interesting work. Um, she was part of the um, Additivist um, Manifesto and Cookbook. But um, she's also using, let's see if this is going to work. She's also using 3D scanning as video, as a subject for video, and uh, we don't have to worry about the audio or anything like that, but she's, she's you know, using it in a different way. Um, she's doing some really interesting work, so there's a plug for her to go see her when she's here. video two of this project where she clandestinely went into um, the Nuys Museum in Berlin and scanned the Nefertiti head bust, sorry, and um, the reason they did it as sort of a clandestine thing is that uh, she's, you know, exploring these ideas of who owns these objects, can these objects be uh, reproduced, uh, and the fact that it being in a Western Museum is sort of um, with very little access for people to actually access. I'm going to talk about sort of the history of, of stealing. Oops. Pause. Cancel. Stop. Oops. Sorry. Just miss. Um, I'll just keep talking. Um, I've only got one other artist to show. Um, but I think this is really interesting because this is at the, you know, we're talking about uh, collections that are in Western museums and their collect collections from. Uh, that are derived from, um, what is the word? Stolen property. Stolen property <laughs> from other countries and other um, groups of people, all in the name of progress. So it's um, another interesting thing of so What she did, what they did is they went in, they had a connect, and she just stuck it in her chest, and she walked around, and she scanned the object. Then she had, the, the, she had cleaned it all up and had made the, you know, the nice model and then distribute it so it was free and, and everything like that. Hmm. Um, Jung Sung, a Korean artist, um, one of the nice things about his work is that he puts his 3D printer in the installation and it runs. And this project here, Prometheus String, is um, taking, this, this project just keeps growing and growing and growing. So, it's printing the sculpture as it goes. So it continually grows and grows and grows. It's about growth, but it's also, there's um, plants in it. There's a kidney bean plant in it. And so that relates to the idea of transferring information over generations. And so he's using the 3D printing in this way. And okay, I'm done. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Creative Manitoba for inviting me um, to taking a risk. Uh, I'm actually definitely not a digital technician or a designer. I believe what I said is I collaborate with my husband, Michael Zayic, who is in fact um, all of those things plus uh, a photographer. So uh, I'm only here uh, in this context speaking about 3D printing um, because we work together and uh, I guess I'm not a very good example of a woman in 3D printing because <laughs> I rely on a man. Um, but um, I uh, am a ceramic artist and I find uh, still and always the uh, technological challenges there are, are enough for a lifetime and more, and um, I will just admit I'm, I'm not willing to put the time in that it would take for me to become uh, savvy, digitally savvy in this way. So I'm going to talk uh, about 
uh, starting with uh, some of my ceramic installations. Uh, this is called Devastatus Remembrari. It is not 3D printed. Uh, I work a lot with porcelain, uh, slip casting, and uh, altered, and mostly I would call it an additive technique. Uh, these trees uh, were all photographed uh, in um, the round using photogrammetry uh, by Michael Zayich, and uh, that actually led to the very first digital print that uh, we created. And uh, here it is. Wow. So if you take one edge of that image, uh, wrap it around, and touch the other edge, it actually makes one section of one of my porcelain uh, trees. And this, uh, it's hard to tell, but is actually on porcelain. And uh, it's quite sizable, about 15 by 30 inches. So this is, in fact, a decal that was made in China. Uh, Jingdezhen, China, it's the imperial porcelain capital of China, where uh, we've actually gone to work several times in residencies. And they were able to make uh, very large decals successfully. The first time we went, we went back, and uh, they were not able to do so successfully when we wanted to enlarge them. So uh, a bit out of desperation and necessity, because I had an exhibition uh, coming up, uh, Michael actually came up with this idea of using the laser cutter to center ceramic. Uh, it's a kind of um, laser marking material that is, in fact, uh, centered onto the porcelain tile. And um, here it is, uh, a test piece. Uh, so we sprayed this uh, laser marker material onto the porcelain, and then it's in fact the heat of the laser cutter that's firing this ceramic material on. It's taking the place of a kiln, and that was uh, really very successful. As you'll see, I'll show some examples in the exhibition. And this uh, was done at North Forge, and um, each piece took uh, many, many hours to print. We were very grateful for uh, the patience of everybody there. And um, so here it is out of the laser cutter. And then the kind of residue uh, of the spray is washed off. And there is Michael uh, giving it a quick dry. So I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. I have lots of images. Uh, then it was time to uh, go big. So these are porcelain tiles custom made in uh, Jingdezhen, China, 20 by 30 inches. So we thought we'd um, scale it up a bit. And uh, here you can see washing off again that residue and uh, revealing the image. It was a series of five pieces. Here they are installed in the gallery. Uh, my show was at the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery in Waterloo, Ontario, and a few close-ups. And uh, then uh, back to uh, North Forge. Here's Michael and uh, Carrie Stevenson uh, working on scanning one of my porcelain forms that had also been made in uh, China. And um, this was our first attempt at 3D printing. So here's some small versions. Uh, we decided we would enter a competition uh, called Shade. So uh, the whole idea was to produce some kind of a lampshade or a light uh, fixture. And there's the drawing for our entry. This is the final 3D print. and. There it is, illuminated. Uh, we quickly realized it wasn't uh, maybe the ideal material. It's a plastic. And um, with the just the heat of the bulb itself, there was, uh, was pretty quickly some discoloration. Anyway, um, uh, needless to say, we did not. Um, we were not successful in the competition. But uh, on the other hand, it was a, a big um, leap into something very new, certainly for my aesthetic. 
And then uh, moving ahead quite a bit to last summer, I thought, well, uh, I'll maybe uh, start playing around with some of the natural matter, which I have collected uh, and often use as, as source material in my ceramic work. So uh, this time we worked at Fab Lab, which is um, at the University of Manitoba, and it's in the Faculty of Architecture. So I was fortunate enough to have a research leave and could uh, delve a little bit more thoroughly into some of this technology. So here's some of the forms with the markers for the scanning. Uh, they weren't particularly successful, these scans. Uh, we tried the cactus. That's actually one of um, my students, Alexandra Ross. Uh, we have an amazing program at the university. It's called the um, Undergraduate Research Award Program, where students get to choose a professor to work with for a whole summer. And um, she's learning uh, how to use the scanner there. Uh, I had made a ceramic form. It's actually um, originally a wedge cut out of a tree, tree trunk. And I had glazed it, and we found that um, the scanning wasn't working at all. It just couldn't pick up anything with the, uh, the shine, the glare of the glaze. So we decided to use um, try a cornstarch and water kind of wash over it, which uh, then resulted in this uh, 3D model. So with that, uh, off we went to this absolutely uh, incredible place called Teeth on 3D. It's in Omaha, Nebraska, and um, they mostly work on, on very high-end uh, 3D printing. Their specialty is printing in clay. And uh, uh, this, this ceramic side of Omaha, uh, a very famous ceramic artist lives there, uh, June Kaneko, who has funded um, a just enormous amounts of research. And um, this is one of his pieces in the courtyard of a very cool um, mid-century modern uh, compound really, house and large studio. So this is where we uh, stayed for one solid week. And the residency is one-on-one. -on -one, so we worked with two technicians uh, every day and we were the only ones there. They were very uh, generous with their time, very attentive. So uh, I decided I wanted to explore this um, sort of uh, the spiky piece which is a sweet uh, gum uh, seed pod. But without uh, very successful scans, the uh, decision was to actually create models on the computer. So a lot of it, that of course, allowed for many, as it does, uh, iterations. And that's something I'm, I'm very interested in and how you know that then can connect with my ceramic work. So, uh, we decided on one particular form, and of course, um, it's very easy then to repeat and um, repeat again. The decision was to uh, go with this model. And here's a photo of Greg Pugh. He's the main technician at Teethon, and he's the one who um, actually develops their proprietary materials. And here we're using the powder printer. This is with uh, stoneware, stoneware clay. So there it's starting to print uh, the support bed. As an artist, I find I'm very fascinated with these great patterns that uh, occur along the way. Here's the piece uh, complete, and it goes in the oven overnight, which is a kind of a parallel with, uh, with ceramics. And uh, there it is in the spray booth. Of course, a lot of the excess powder has to be removed. And that was the final form. It's still on its support bed, which it in fact still is because it's extremely fragile. Probably would destroy it if I tried to remove it. So uh, what was that <clears throat> for? Uh, pure experimentation at that point. Uh, then we thought we'd try some of uh, the same forms, but this time, in the Moonray resin printer, also at Teethon. And uh, here we are uh, creating about five or so uh, different uh, seed pods. And uh, this was interesting because it was really only about, I would say, a 50% success rate. 
whereas with the powder printer, it was a, a full success rate. So there you can see the, the resin, which is mixed with a, a porcelain. And again, of course, these are proprietary materials. They will never tell us what's really in there. But um, there they are hanging on. And then, of course, in this case, the supports, uh, they, the forms were removed from the supports. This stuff is super expensive, so every drop is saved, recycled. He's screening it here for the next round. And there's some of the results. So these are porcelain, and um, once um, they come out of the printers, uh, they um, then actually go into a kiln in the same way ceramics or clay normally does. The ginkgo leaf was just a sort of comparison um, and for scale. Uh, and then back to this form, which uh, had taken on sort of a weird, almost volcano-like um, connotation for me, uh, decided to make it as a mesh. And for me, the 3D printing really has to be about what can it do that I can't do by hand? So, you know, what can it actually um, inject into my, my uh, repertoire and aesthetic. So here uh, is the um, 3D model ready to go. Again, this one with the larger works, um, obviously for size of printer, but also cost was done in stoneware as well. And we decided to add a few of um, these other little forms along with it just to fill, fill the space. So there it is. Um, then, uh, again, once all the powder is removed, it's been in the oven, an actual oven for um, a night, it actually goes into kilns. Again, just the same way um, clay normally does. So those are the results from uh, the one-week workshop. So then I thought, well, how do I um, combine um, that 3D aesthetic, but with my own um, 3D forms, again, created uh, fully by hand. And I started playing around with the support material, incorporating that into the, the hand-built forms I had made. I had uh, worked, uh, actually, all summer on a new palette. Uh, these are glazes um, made with rare earth oxides. And uh, again, with those 3D printed forms, once uh, they come out of the kiln, uh, like, uh, again, uh, regular ceramic work, I can glaze them, which is what I did. So now you see it's been glazed with uh, black and some of my um, rare earth oxide glazes. So uh, with the re research leave, I uh, had the privilege of um, moving around a bit and going to the resources. Uh, this is 3D printing in clay as well, but uh, this time in Canada at the um, Alberta University of the Arts, formerly called ACAD. And uh, they are doing clay extrusion printing, which is way, way more accessible, certainly in terms of price. And I decided to have that same form printed. So again, I'm very interested to see what uh, does each um, method, you know, each uh, piece of machinery, how does that inform the work, even if it's is this, uh, starting with the very same uh, object or form. And uh, this is something that um, Manitoba hasn't uh, until very recently uh, approached. The uh, people in Fab Lab at the University of Manitoba actually did get together with the engineering department and have built their own um, clay extrusion printer head. So it's, it's really just in its infancy. Uh, so the piece was printed half and then half again. And then I did uh, do some embellishment and uh, tried to make it a little bit more my own. Again, um, trying to impart uh, a sort of combination of, of the new and then things that are maybe a little bit more familiar and uh, also working with the flaws because this piece really caved in and I just decided to embrace that and uh, run with it. So that piece has yet to be uh, glazed and fired. 
And um, then uh, my last slides are actually very recent work. These are not 3D printed. These uh, are uh, hand built in porcelain. And again, working with that same volcano-like form and uh, creating these sort of growths. They're sort of odd um, hybrid fungal floral objects. But uh, focusing now more on the inserts, as I call them, or the plumes. So looking at these, uh, paying attention especially to the one in the center here, uh, these went through a long uh, process. Uh, digital process where first they were photographed by Michael and again put through uh, a whole process which resulted in finally a 3D model. But along the way, I found uh, some of these images were really captivating. This kind of x ray form where it's something that's really ethereal, it's so uh, opposite from the uh, earthiness of clay and. Um, I thought that it had a nice kind of um, resonance in terms of, again, starting with the very same form, but coming uh, out at the other end with something really quite opposite. So these are all based on, um, I chose the colors very carefully because they also connect to the uh, colors of the rare earth oxide. Uh, glazes I'd been working on. So for instance, here we have uh, Priseodymium, the green, and then there's um, an Erbium tangerine mix as well. And here, Neodymium, and then a few other um, oxides that I was playing around with, manganese dioxide, and also a blue cobalt. Uh, and then, um, they ended up in my recent uh, exhibition at the Art Gallery of Burlington, uh, which is in Ontario. So this is uh, daring for me, and um, I deliberated a lot about whether or not, um, you know, I'm still struggling with the sort of, I guess, legitimacy or imposter syndrome, <laughs> and uh, working with, with ceramics, uh, there are a few uh, purists still left around. So I teach and I find it interesting because um, even my students, you know, will ask, well, why, why would you want to do that? <laughs> so I think the, it's, the, the novelty has worn off, I would say, just in general. But um, I do find that really now uh, people are finding a way to, to make it uh, art. And uh, I will end with this, the final uh, experiment, 3D printing in bronze, again, using that same uh, plume, the erbium plume, and you've seen a few iterations now. So this is actually um, printed at Shapeways from a 3D model that Michael had made. And um, it's a combination of stainless steel. It's a stainless steel with bronze uh, matrix. And uh, I'll just end by saying this is the successful one, but just like clay, I find this has just as many uh, challenges uh, and the technology. It's um, a very long um, sort of process and very complex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. That was very interesting. It was very cool. Uh, Chris is going to come up. We're going to just take two seconds to swap over the technology. <clears throat> Hello. Test, test. <laughs> all right. So as you were introduced, I'm Christopher. Uh, thank you all for, I guess, listening to me. Um, we're going to start. So, so I started out with a idea to try to make a modernized take for the traditional indigenous or aboriginal arts or artifacts. And I decided to start with the Dreamcatcher. Um, the first step towards that was learning about 3D printing and how it all worked. I received training and I did my research at Northforge 
very helpful bunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, they they provided me with the the proper equipment and tools to to pursue that. So I started off with um, what I call prototypes or, uh, for my project. Uh, so this first ring here is uh, 3D printed from, I believe, the MakerBot, um, which is this machine here. And it was printing my, my first uh, prototypes. Um, the bed was pretty small, so I had to print the parts in two. <laughs> uh, but then later on, I learned that Northforge provided larger printing beds, so I could do single uh, prints. Now, these, I learned that with 3D printing that um, it takes quite a while to make one mold, as I call them. Uh, and it, it then acted as a positive for, for um, casting. So what I did was I wanted to incorporate a lot of modern materials into my dream catcher, aside from the traditional like wood, sinew, uh, uh, string, whatever you call it, um, and think about what we use in today's uh, society, which is like metals, uh, acrylics, um, steel. Uh, so I took the uh, 3D printed uh, mold and I started to cast it in silicone. So the silicone then acted as a negative for the new positives, which were going to be made out of a resin and concrete compound. Uh, and you can see here I was testing with my molds and shapes and the mix uh, to get the perfect ratio. Um, <clears throat> then I moved on to prototyping with the other aspects for the dream catcher. So the feathers, uh, beads, um, the, the other components which I will then be casting as concrete, but I thought, well, feathers wouldn't make a really good uh, material made out of concrete, so I opted out for um, 3D printed at the beginning. So this is my very first final prototype that I made, which is a concrete dream catcher uh, with steel chain woven uh, or wound around it, and then some 3D printed feathers, but I didn't fully appreciate the aesthetic. So I, I went back to testing. Um, here's another photo. Uh, I obviously used the 3D printing um, for a lot of the, the initial steps for new prototypes, I would print out a ring and then just take some string and wrap it around and try to figure out what I liked most. Uh, test fitting a lot of the materials. I, I had like wire and string fishing line, everything. I was trying to stay true to the indigenous um, themes to, to sort of make them uh, fit. So like, you know, uh, fishing line. Uh, maybe that ties into the indigenous fishing community. Um, building materials made of, upgraded from, you know, sticks and stones to rocks and concrete. So here's a bunch more molds that I was testing. I Unfortunately, it was a bad photographer when I was doing all my steps. I never <laughs> really did a lot of work in progress things, but I brought some of them here. Um, <clears throat> then I, I was assembling much larger pieces. And then I 
used uh, Northforge's laser machines to cut out acrylic uh, feathers and uh, rastering and etching them to give a texture that I I liked. So I hand drew everything in an Illustrator program and exported it out and then into Corel and it would do its thing from there. Um, very painstaking process, I thought it was. <laughs> Uh, and then it landed up to my final, uh, my main product, which is the steel concrete dream catcher. So <clears throat> here's the beads I was talking about, which were 3D printed, then casted, and then filled the forms with uh, concrete and resin to create this lovely aesthetic. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's been a fun process learning about 3D printing. I I knew nothing about it until a year ago. I I took my time learning the software, uh, learning Fusion 360. It, it was a very fun 3D program. I had previous. Um, 3D modeling uh, experience from other software, uh, but I feel like Fusion has a better grasp for dimensions and crafting what you want. Um, the, the other thing is uh, 3D printing was, was always going to be like a, a starting phase. It, it wasn't going to be my one to be all finisher. I I always envisioned it to be like prototypes, as I said, where it would mark me off for for test fitting and trying to figure out what I want to lead with, and it's pretty much that. I'm not really super into three D printing um, crazy sculptures, but I may try that eventually. Um, yeah, so. I can show some other works if that's all right. So I also do had some uh, laser uh, laser training. So I I would take materials that I was familiar with, like the concrete and resin, and I would laser out shapes that I drew, and I would create. Um, jewelry as well. So I'm very fascinated with crescent moons. I, I don't know why. I I like their shape. So I made like a moon phase earring set. Um, I might try doing a 3D print with uh, laser cutting and trying to incorporate every um, tool and equipment to make maybe some sort of grand piece eventually. Um, Just some prototypes and designs that I've drawn up over the course of a year. And then I also hand drew uh, my own images for, uh, I was starting a Seven's Teachings um, theme and, you know, the bear, and the wolf, eagle, turtle, um, the animals that represent the community, uh, I thought that was something that I could also bring into a modernized form. So I would laser etch those into blocks of wood as hanging plaques. Um, and I would slowly build a set. Uh, I may plan on eventually 3D printing those as a form to cast in concrete as well to make uh, even larger um, projects. Uh, but yeah, it's just me having fun. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing most of the time, but I, I think it's, it's interesting to see where it leads me. Uh, uh, my stuff 
just recently was uh, at, uh, um, placed in the Urban Shaman Art Gallery uh, for their 50 to 500, um, what do you call it, uh, program? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's going on right now. It's a fantastic uh, place. There's lots of neat artwork, and I'm very thankful to have it displayed there. It's, it's a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Chris. That was, that was great. Um, I've got a couple of little questions, so maybe we can get the panelists to come back up and um, <clears throat> some sort of mundane uh, procedural questions first, and then we can uh, take some some questions from the audience. Um, I just before we do that, I at the beginning I forgot to thank uh, the partners in this program, which are Video Pool um, hosting here today. So thank you very much. Emma is at the back and. Uh, this is a great thing. Uh, New Media Manitoba is also a partner, and this program is funded by the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Fund. So thanks to them for that. So my, my first question is, maybe quickly we could just uh, start along here and, and each ask you, how, how do you get started in, like, not how did you find your way into it, but what would be the first steps in a, a 3D print process for you, what, how, where would you where would you start? Um, lots of googling, probably, <laughs> googling and uh, asking uh, mentors for help and instruction where to lead off. Um, a prototype, as I said, like just you know, draw some sketches, get an idea, and play around with. Uh, your your experiments, you know, don't don't be afraid of if you'll pass or fail. Just have fun with it, and you know, I think that's that's how I approach it is by thinking of it as a starting a stepping stone. Um, pass it on. Because I'm um, is that on? Because I'm relying on others uh, for the tech. For me, it really has to do with uh, going to the source, finding the context that makes it possible for me. And that was uh, originally uh, North Forge at the time called Ascent Works. And um, then really just uh, taking the time, making the effort to seek the resources and um, hopefully uh, also being somewhat instrumental in uh, making it more accessible, or at least uh, being able to make um, my students more aware of those resources. And that's, uh, for me, a lot of the, um, the motivation here, because I am a teacher and also a researcher. I feel that it is, in fact, my responsibility, even if I don't end up being um, really tech savvy digitally that at least I can point my students to all of those resources. I've got one. Oh. <laughs> we'll share these, they'll share this one. Uh, for me, I'm uh, sort of, everything kind of starts research based where um, I just kind of get an idea and then sort of one of the things not, you know, being in Winnipeg is you got to find out what's here, what's available here. And um, there's, lots of resources here and I, again like all of us we kind of went up made our way over to ascent works now known as uh, north forge um, video pool also has a 3d printer as well so the uh, if you're already a member who's working in video and thinks oh something completely different i want to try that video pool also has the resources um, there's also a hacker space. I don't know if people are familiar with it. Is it still called Skull Space? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So they, I don't think they have 3D printers, but there's that's another resource in Winnipeg. Um, they, um, they're kind of different in that they're, they're really kind of into the build it yourself 
make it your make it your own. So it's a bit of a different instead of sort of industrial um, sized printing machines or industrial sized laser uh, etching machines or anything like that. They they're kind of into like how do you make a machine? So that's another resource as well. I hear that question often was when someone comes to um, the women in 3D printing uh, meeting that we have and they're curious, they, they um, have never used a 3D printer and they ask what should they do as their first step to learn more about 3D printing. I don't want to sound too self-serving, but um, we do at North Forge, the fabrication lab on Adelaide Street, we do have basic 3D printing training, and that's what I took when I first um, wanted to learn how to use it. And just um, meeting other people and having that community of support. If you get stuck, you have a question, or you're not sure how to do something, there's likely someone else around who's done it um, and who can help you out. I know the Winnipeg Library also has 3D printers. I don't know if they have training, but that's also a resource where you could go there and um, try out 3D printing at the library. We're actually part of this um, series of workshops that we're going to be doing. We're going to be compiling uh, local resources. We've got a very brief one here, and we're going to collect a bunch more of the links and information, and we'll we'll have those on the Creative Manitoba website as sort of a 3D printing resource um, page that, that you'll be able to. We'll have it sometime next week, and uh, we'll continue to do this as we do these different series, but we'll, we'll compile it. We've got one that you can take away right now. It's got uh, Video Pool, North Forge, Skull Space, and the Idea Mill at the library links on there so we'll, we'll do that um, my next question why don't we start down there with you Marnie would be what um, the modeling software is clearly an important part of the process um, what can you talk about the the kind of software that you like to play with or that you find accessible or, or yeah. works for your needs so to be honest it's taken me a, about five years until I started 3D to try 3D modeling. I was honestly like I was five years where I would get find a model and 3D print it, but I wasn't 3D modeling. I was intimidated to to try it, and I didn't know which. Like there's so many different 3D modeling softwares, I didn't know which one to try, and it wasn't until this year, um, the community of support that I have around 3D printing, they all started talking about Autodesk Fusion 360 and that being the easiest one to try. So this year, I um, applied for a license through Autodesk as a startup and I, I got a free license for a year. So I've been teaching myself Fusion 360 I did take one course on it. Uh, it was a three-hour course on Fusion 360. Um, there's a lot of tutorials on Autodesk on how to use it. Um, I didn't bring any samples or photos of my prints after using <laughs> Fusion 360, but I was successful to get to a point of 3D printing something that I'm not sure what it is, but um, it was my first print that I, I did with Fusion 360. So anyways, I would that's a software I would recommend because um, if I can figure out how to use it, really anyone can. Okay, uh, open source software is Blender. Um, I have not used it. I, I personally find the learning curve for Blender, for my own, <laughs> didn't work for me. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, I use Rhino um, or Rhinoceros. Uh, it's uh, that software I showed you when I was spinning the uh, hammer scan. Um, I use my scanner instead of um, building. I do build stuff originally like from scratch, but 
I do use the scanner because I kind of find it kind of fun to just sort of scan something and then plop it into the software and just play with it and just sort of see what I can kind of come up with. Um, does Google, is Google, there used to be Google SketchUp. Does that still exist? Okay, open source. So that's another available software. Those are the only ones I know. Um, anyone else? Oh yeah. Also, uh, Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop. You can do 3D um, build it. You can build 3D models in Adobe Photoshop now too. Um, so you you might if you've got that. Um, it has. You know, you can start with just like squares and circles and start putting stuff together. Uh, squares and circles. Cubes and spheres. Sorry, <laughs> 3D, not 2D. <laughs> okay. well, I'm just going to add, I don't know if there's anybody here who um, is at a very, very basic level, but one of the big advantages of going to Teeth on 3D is that they actually uh, forced me to sit in front of a computer and learn Tinkercad. So <laughs> that is not a bad place to start. And, um, you know, it has its limitations, of course. But I think uh, there can be a lot of uh, fear and intimidation. I can totally relate to um, the five-year syndrome. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I think just to, to break through that, to have non-intimidating people on hand and um, you know, not embarrass you and <laughs> make you feel small. So uh, you know, I think at least it's a way to um, gain some understanding. It, it was pretty much um, invaluable to me. Um. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I would recommend Fusion 360 as well for a good starter. Um, it's pretty genuinely well used for 3D printing. I'm not sure about sculpting a whole lot. I know you mentioned ZBrush, and I heard that ZBrush is a very viable option too, but I'm not sure how well it translates for uh, uh, exporting G code into 3D printers. So, my knowledge is very limited in that, but yeah, it's all just do a little bit of research which software matches with which um, program for extruding your 3D prints. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna ask one more question and then we can open it up to a conversation. The question of ethics and digital technology kind of comes up. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what your thoughts are? Are there, are there dangers or are there cautionary steps that need to be taken to make sure that 3D printing is used in an ethical way, whether it's the materials? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about plastic waste. Is that, a, is that a problem? Are there different substrates that can be used? Or perhaps in your case, Chris, is, you know, bridging that, uh, you know, cultural uh, divide between yeah. indigenous you know, cultural teachings and modern processes and stuff like that. So just sort of what are, what are your thoughts? Are there thoughts off the top of your head around the ethics of 3D printing? Well, in my case, I think it's it's very important to, to have that uh, defined line between the traditional and contemporary sort of artwork. Um, but I also think that we shouldn't shy away from from combining them and and maybe expanding on on the culture for that. Um, that that's what I have for that point. The the ethics of the material, uh, the waste is is a bit marginal. I I, I see a lot of waste um, being tossed around, and maybe maybe in the future there will be. Uh, a better method for 3D printers. Uh, maybe they'll be more efficient. Uh, and I guess it, it's, it all depends up to the user, how they, how they use the 3D printer. Uh, a lot of time people, uh, the machines, they, they sometimes um, 
have accidents, I guess, and they, they'll ruin your print and that whole project you spent on like a bottle, printing a bottle and fail and you'd have to toss it out, all out. So uh, I, I don't think you can do much other than recycling. Um, so just be careful, I guess. <laughs> For me, I would say uh, the ethics mostly revolve around, uh, are you cheating? Is it real? And um, in terms of the um, field I work in, uh, ceramics, you know, uh, again, there's a lot of questions around why would you do it? Is there any real sort of legitimacy if you're not the one making it directly? And um, I, you know, I, I don't actually adhere to that sort of philosophy because to me it's another tool, tool in the toolkit and a means to an end ultimately. And you know, it's exciting. It's a way to, um, you know, uh, create re reiterations maybe a little bit more easily than you could on your own. And a lot of it, of course, you simply could not. Uh, create by hand. So there's a lot of questions around that, uh, which I alluded to earlier. The other part of it would be um, definitely the uh, materials, uh, the toxicity, the powder printing has just a massive amount, especially with the uh, stoneware uh, clay, uh, massive amounts of silica dust floating around. And um, even at teeth on a very you know high-end production facility, uh, they weren't particularly careful about that. Um, again, I work in ceramics, so of course I'm very aware of uh, health hazards and the precautions that have to be taken. So I would hope that uh, just in future there will be more attention paid to that. And uh, in terms of waste, plastics, I suppose there could be certainly questions around that as well. Uh, doing it directly in clay, Maybe that's one um, way to minimize the guilt that I would <laughs> experience that way. So yeah, I think that's a very good question that I would and will be thinking about. Uh, for me, it's uh, I, I kind of think about the the objects and the idea of replicating an object and the idea of copyright or copyleft or no copyright, um, the idea of, um, um, I'm sure people have heard in the past, this hasn't really come up very much anymore, no one's really talking about it, but the idea of the 3D printed gun, uh, that, that was quite the conversation uh, a while ago, and the idea of uh, um, uh, the additive, the additive-ist cookbook has a bunch of, um, projects, I think, I don't know if, the, I don't think the gun's in that one, but uh, there's ideas of sort of being able, so, okay, I'm not for, for oh, let me just stop for a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> for me, uh, I find it interesting of the, the idea that the three, 3D printing can be very subversive and that you can, um, kind of owns your own mean, own your own means of production, but at the same time, um, thinking about pumping out plastic objects over and over and over again. Uh, that's a difficult thing, but I'm sure Marnie is gonna let us know exactly, since, since she's just come back from uh, a conference on, on the industry as to all the different kinds of materials there are, because you know it doesn't have to be you're printing in plastic. There's tons of other things you can print. But going back to the actual objects, um, one of the things, I'm just going to say this quickly, but one of the things that I was, when I was researching um, a few years ago, is that the idea that 3D printing was going to make it uh, so that we'd all, you know, if your part of your phone broke, you would go to a store and you'd get the part, the, 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 um, the documents, and then you'd 3D print the part. And it's like it was going to change manufacturing forever and we'd all have all of this. Uh, uh, fix my mouse wheel or something like that. And I, it, what's, what's interesting I find is that industry just did not like that. And you never saw these sort of fix it yourself kind of stores. So that kind of like that, that utopian um, 
ideal just sort of went, but um, I don't know. I think it's subversive. I think it's, it has its challenges. It has its bad things. It has its good things. Um, Um, Erica's um, example with the iPhone parts, it is 3D printing additive manufacturing is reducing a ton of um, parts um, being warehoused in large industries like rail, uh, railroad, aerospace, like rather than, um, and this is starting to take place now, rather than having a warehouse full of extra parts for railroad cars, they're being printed on demand now. So it's reducing a lot of waste that way. Um, I heard last week good news um, from a sustainability and biomaterial um, perspective that a lot of larger 3D print vendors are developing materials to be sustain like sustainable bio um, recyclable uh, materials, which is good news because I hadn't really heard that before. And there's some uh, 3D print companies that have materials that like the whole 360 um, workflow in place where they're uh, recycling. Um, excess material and being able to reuse it again and even 3d printed parts that fail they can reuse those parts like melt it or whatever the process is but they're reusing the material in a, a full you know 360 workflow which is good news yeah that's great news thank you um does anybody in the audience have any questions um, can I just get you to come? We're, we're just making a, a sort of a podcast of this, so if you want to just come and grab the microphone and ask your question. Um, hi, this is a question, I guess, more for Erica and, and Marnie. Um, so one thing that I've seen within 3D printing is um, scale and restrictions of scale. Um, as a person who works with large uh, installation and that sort of thing, that's one thing that's attractive to me is wanting to get into 3D printing, but to take it to uh, a larger um, kind of level. So would you be able to talk about the accessibility of um, industrial strength 3D printers? Um, Erica, you briefly mentioned um, industry kind of um, 3D printers, and I've seen videos of, of people like 3D printing houses and that sort of thing, but I'm just wondering how the public can kind of um, get into that or, or access it. Thank you. So, thanks. Yeah, we there are some very large format 3D printers out there. Um, Big Rep is one of them um, for very large, very large, I don't know of one, I don't know of any that large in Manitoba. We do have a Fortis 3D printer. So your your 3D print is um, will only be as large as the print bed. And you can um, make several prints and glue them together. I've seen that before. And you you see a, a seam, but then you can you can paint it. Um, uh, just yeah, I, one thing. Um, you know the robotic arm. A lot of um, one ways you can sort of get out, of, kind of get out of the idea of the the three D printed box box thing is that you have this robotic arm that can build, and I'm sure you've seen those huge robotic arms that build extruded concrete houses and stuff like that. So um, I think there's room for tinkerers who want to try to build things like that. But um, then, you know, I guess the engineering and everything starts to come in. Um, yeah, I, I this. If you build it, you, you know, you can build it, you can make it. Maybe. I don't know. And at, um, okay. at 
University of Manitoba, you said that they built um, a clay extruder. It is, yeah, in fact, a printer head for a robotic arm. Yeah, the robotic arm, though, sits on a tabletop. So it's, uh, you know, still limited capacity. But um, as I said earlier, it's uh, very new still. And uh, the technicians are just starting to move into uh, printing uh, using the printer head. And uh, I'll be actually collaborating with them uh, next year, next semester, on a project for students. Because I think this is um, a very good question, Casey, in terms of scale, also cost. And that is of total relevance to uh, students, for sure. And um, you know, how do you then reconcile that without it being only uh, small object oriented? So it's still um, very new, but um, Again, I would hope for, for bigger and better coming up. I guess to, for Grace, it's a long tradition in art that, uh, from what I understand, that, that uh, Alex, can't hear you very well. <laughs> there's a long tradition in art where uh, people have worked with technology uh, or people would work with assistants like Michelangelo. All these people had tons of, I guess, extended warm wear. So the idea of being the one that is the creative person that, uh, that comes up with the ideas and explores things and works with other people, I, I don't think anyone has to feel bad about that. There wouldn't be a film made without uh, you know, uh, a group of people collaborating, each bringing their aspect into it. And in fact, I think that's what makes it exciting. You know, and that's why I think this group is uh, really interesting because I'm working in my bedroom essentially and it's like, you know, it's hard to keep track of whatever's going on and it's inspiring to see what other people are doing. Um, yeah, and the idea of collaborating, which each person brings something to it, I think is important. Well, do you want to say more? And the idea of working vertically like you can work on VR, and in order to do that, you need to learn lighting, sculpture, painting, photography. And so you can print some stuff, you can, you know, other stuff could be used in other ways. So it's not just about making objects, it's one aspect of a lot of ways of approaching. Awesome, thanks very much. Do we have any other, any last questions, comments? Um, At North Forge, if I come in and want something printed, is there like a cost or how We're does? Not a, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, good question. We're not a print service. How it works is um, members join, people join as a member. They learn how to use the equipment and they do it themselves. But if you don't want to do that or if, like if you don't have time or you would like someone else to print something for you. There is a rap, it's a rapid prototyping form on northforge.ca that you can fill out. It goes out to our members and if someone has the resources and the ability to help you out, then they'll contact you. It's a really good, I, I have to say it's really good. <laughs> I just have to say that, you know, across Canada, there are not a lot of fab labs and Winnipeg, has probably the best, one of the best, outside of the universities, because there's fab labs in universities, but to have a community-based fab lab is just an amazing thing. And so for this organization to exist is just superb. And um, yeah, you don't, you're not, you're not going to find them. This is, it's quite a unique thing. It's quite a treasure to have. Awesome. Plug. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to wrap it up unless anybody has any last burning comments, questions. <clears throat> we will be, uh, there are a couple of things on your way out. There's a, a quick sheet with some, some resources and we are going to beef that all up and put it on our, our website. And if, um, if you've left your email, we'll send you an email update about it. Uh, next week, same place, same time, we have another fabulous panel. 
exploring the state of VR, and we've got some really awesome uh, tech folks, uh, Les Clausen from Flipside, uh, Freya Olofsson, who uh, the two of them have been working together. Freya is a, a, a dancer um, and working in, in the forefront of VR as a performance tool. Um, so that's going to be here next Saturday at 2 p.m. if you want to come back. And the last thing I want to say is we've got a little, uh, a little evaluation that if you could fill it out, take two minutes on the way out to give us some some feedback we would really appreciate that so thanks again to the to the panelists uh marnie erica grace christopher and uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your saturday